This is the Permaculture Podcast. I'm Scott Mann. In this episode, co-host David Bilbrey continues to explore the edge between permaculture, business, and social change by sitting down with Dr. Otto Scharmer. Together they talk about Dr. Scharmer's work on presencing and theory U, the development of effective organizations, and how each of us can become more powerful change makers. Enjoy this conversation with Otto and David, and I'll join you again after. Hi, this is David Bilbrey with EcoThinkIt.com, and I'm here today with Otto Scharmer. Dr. Otto Scharmer is a senior lecturer at, at MIT and a founding chair of the Presencing Institute. He introduced the concept of presencing, which is a lear- learning from the emerging future in his best-selling books, Theory U and Presence, and now The Essentials of Theory U. In 2015, he co-founded the online MIT XU Lab that has since activated a global ecosystem of societal and personal renewal involving more than 100,000 users from 185 countries. Welcome, Otto. Thanks for taking the time to be with me today. Thank you for having me on, David. To begin, would you tell us a bit about yourself, uh, your background and origin story? Well, I am a farm boy. I I grew up on a farm near Hamburg, just uh, 40 30 miles north of Hamburg in northern Germany. And in fact, my parents happened to be pioneers of uh, organic and biodynamic farming in Germany. So they were among the first to switch to this way of running their farm that really looks at everything from a living ecosystem point of view. And I think both the ecological aspects of that, but also the the, the social and cultural, including what does it mean when a very, uh, you know, traditional community of farmers, one person moves a different way, which means that everyone else looks a little bad, which, which was normal before. Suddenly, kind of, they put pesticides and herbicides on their uh, fields. So there was a lot of negative backlash and you know swimming against the stream isn't easy plus you know 10 years of no one knew how to do it actually right so the uh the the harvest went down and all these other things so i learned from watching my parents and uh, uh, growing up in that context that if you follow your own thinking if you follow what, what what you think is true that puts you at at odds with the majority and uh before you know, the ministers and the television and the newspapers come in and celebrate you as the role model of the future. There are decades of really hard hardship and, and situations where, you know, maybe other other people uh, would have given up. And that was very instructive to me because any kind of uh, innovator, as we all know, if you take on the, uh, the, the big assumptions that people in your community share, you will get a negative reaction because uh, social systems, social organisms, like um, something that's called the the immune system, right? And the immune system, whenever the immune system is detecting something that doesn't belong here, that doesn't fit our own assumptions, then the immune system does what it's designed to do, which is to to, to kill the intruders. And, and that's, of course, what, what, what happens in organizations what happens in societies, and that's why innovation is is uh, taught, is, is a practice of leadership, because it is the leader's job to create environments where we can experiment with the, these new ways of operating, so that we um, begin to grow these seeds, and then kind of when they develop well, put them um, uh, into a different um, place where they can be um, replicated, and where they can go to scale more easily. So. I owe a lot of uh, what I do to uh, my parents to this these first two decades on the farm, and I remember every Sunday my um, my parents would take us, so it's me and my three siblings, uh, on a feldgang, right, a field walk. So we would kind of walk the the fields of the farm, and every now and then my father would stop and um, bend down and take a, a clump of uh, soil and teach us kind of uh, about the qualities of the soil because what do you do when you grow up on a farm right you know for two decades you listen you know the variations of the same conversation which is how to improve the quality of the soil because that's kind of the main thing that you really have as an as i don't need to tell you so 
when I look at my own work today, I, uh, you know, sometimes I think I moved on and moved away quite a bit, right? So from Hamburg, now I'm here in Boston, East Coast, there are quite quite a few miles in between. But in reality, it's really uh, pretty much the same thing because uh, what I'm doing and what many of my colleagues are doing today and probably also many of the listeners are doing is improving the quality of the social soil, right? So as, as a farmer, you focus on improving the quality of the agricultural soil and that, of course, is the alpha and omega of everything including on a farm, but also including all other ventures in society today. If you really want to make some headway, what you need to do is to improve the quality of the social soil. And that's, I guess, kind of uh, what, uh, what I have been focusing on um, over the past few decades. So I'd like to talk a little bit more about uh, sort of the connection between living soil and sort of the soil of the social field. But first... Can you tell me a little bit more about how you came to the work that you've been doing for the last 20 plus years? I, I remember when I uh, uh, finished my um, PhD in management and economics at a university in Germany. So uh, the title of that thesis and, um, you know, no one ever read that. So never mind if, if the title doesn't sound really accessible. But it, it's basically the title was Reflective Modernization of Capitalism as Revolution from Within. So it's basically how to modernize or transform capitalism as a revolution from within. So within as a synonym of you know, changing consciousness, I guess. So that was all good. But you know, what I realized is so I could you know, you know, write a big thesis. But what difference really does it make in reality? And the answer is, sadly, very little, if any. So realizing that, I asked myself, where in the world actually are research institutes where I could learn how to do research in a way that actually is helpful for the practitioners in the field, that actually is helpful and makes a practical difference for those who are actually the change agents, who are actually the, the, the people who are changing things as we speak. That question brought me here to MIT, to what back then was called the MIT Learning Center, that Peter Senge, that probably is familiar to some of the listeners, had been founding just a few years before. And so Peter Senge is, uh, became um, really well known back then. This is kind of during the, mid, uh, the early 1990s. And he became well known for really not inventing, but popularizing the concept of organizational learning. So how the art and practice, how organizations learn. And he came out of the same institute, the System Dynamics Group here at MIT, that 20 years earlier, in the 1970s, early 1970s, brought out the Limits to Growth study. Kind of that, back then, helped to spark the global environmental movement with the report to the uh, Club of Rome and the, uh, the book with that title, Limits to Growth. So he joined in the 1970s, this institute, and what did he see? He see, well, kind of we create all these smart PhD students, kind of they know everything and, you know, they can calculate everything when basically when the world is going to hell. But what's the impact? Close to zero, right? So very little. Um, so that was his question. How can we develop methods and tools that actually put these insights, like kind of the limits of uh, to growth study, to practice so that we actually change the way our e economies are, are operating? And that brought him onto the pathway of organizational learning, which then 20 years on, he launched on a global scale. And that was really kind of the, the body of work that drew me here from Germany and that I um, joined. So when I did join, what did I find here? So basically, a number of projects where people have been very successful in applying the tools of organizational learning to you know, the change initiatives that they wanted to bring about. And then in some other cases, the same tools applied by other people with very little impact. So what is it then that accounts for the difference? So you have the same tools that in the, in the hand of few have a huge impact in the hand of others have not. And to cut a long story short, kind of the, the research that focuses on really what accounts for the difference and so forth can be best summarized 
with the words of a CEO that back then I, I happened to interview. His name is Bill O'Brien. And uh, when he summarized his own experience of leading transformative change throughout a number of different uh, organizations and episodes, he did that with the following words. He said, the success of an intervention depends on the interior condition of the intervener. So in other words, let me rephrase. The success of what I do as a change maker depends on the inner place from that I operate. So he basically says that the success of what we do, you know, in the social field, kind of in, in the area of social change, not only depends on what we do, not only depends on how we do it, but depends on the inner place, the source from that we operate. And what does it mean, this inner place, this source? If, for example, it means the quality of our attention, the quality of how we listen, the quality of our intention. So, when I heard him saying that sentence, it was as if kind of somebody kind of, I don't know, you could say it switched on a light or kind of some, somebody, it was as if kind of a new question opened up in front of my eyes or a new dimension of really how to look at social change and how to look at the phenomenon that very often in organizational change uh, stories kind of, there's a lot of input, a lot of effort and very little outcome. So it reminded me of the conversations at our family farm, because just as, uh, you know, you can say just in agriculture, really, particularly in organic or biodynamic or sustainable agriculture, we know very well that the visible outcome of what, what is growing, the quality of what we see and the quality of the harvest is a function of the quality of the soil on which kind of whatever meets the eye, whatever is visible above the ground uh, is growing. So when you apply that kind of that, you know, it's, it's basically saying, okay, in agriculture, kind of there's like two realms, kind of there's kind of the visible realm above the soil, and then there is the quality of the soil. It's kind of that what is at first invisible to the eye. But every farmer knows that, you know, the key to a good harvest, to key to, you know, sustainable results is improving the quality of the soil. And likewise, in the uh, social realm, in the organizational realm, we can say that the quality of the visible results that we create is a function of the quality of relationships, is the function of the quality of how we converse and think together, is the function of the quality of our attention, kind of how we listen to each other. So that's basically kind of this distinction between what's visible to the eye and what are kind of the deeper conditions, kind of the source conditions, what is basically below the surface of the soil, what is the quality of the topsoil. That really opened my eyes to, uh, to these types of questions. And I think it's a, it, it's a pretty good analogy kind of for uh, what, what happens uh, on the farm. I think in many ways, we can compare the work of the farmer with the work of change makers in the social field. And I think one, um, one of the key uh, similarities is, as a farmer, as, as we know, you can't make a plant grow. And um, you can't go there and say, now grow. So it's impossible. It would be ridiculous to do that. All we can do in farming is to create kind of uh, hospitable conditions, kind of to improve the quality of the conditions. And exactly the same is true in the social realm. Of course, the language of change management is totally screwed up, right? It's like kind of driving change and all these nonsense mechanical terminology. I mean, when was it the last time when you asked your, your spouse or your partner whether they would like kind of you driving their change, right? Not, <laughs> no, no, but I mean, it would be ridiculous, right? So. Right. Yet, that's exactly the language we, we, we learn in management. We learn in both business schools. Kind of, we teach at business schools. And, you know, it all speaks to kind of the old misfit mental model that we apply to 
really living social systems, right? Whether we meet them in agriculture or whether we meet them in, in living ecosystems and, and organizations. You know, I, I was I was thinking about going to get my master's degree in organizational development back in 2010-11 before I was introduced to uh, permaculture. And one of the things that I found from talking to people that work in that field was their whole systems thinkers that believe in you know everything we're talking about but going into corporations where they don't have that paradigm they will hire you and pay money for your advice and then not implement it and <laughs> that deterred me from that immediate path although the heart and the vision of of that is still very much alive in me and has uh, been greatly fueled by you and and others that uh, that I've been reading and, and learning about in the last couple of years. What you were just saying made me think of a quote from Peter Singe. It's common to say that trees come from seeds, but how can a tiny seed create a huge tree? Seeds do not contain the resources needed to grow a tree. They must come from the medium or environment within which the tree grows. But the seed does provide something that is crucial, a place where the whole of the tree starts to form. As resources such as water and nutrients are drawn in, the seed organizes the process that generates growth. In a sense, the seed is a gateway through which the future possibility of a living tree emerges. And so what I hear you saying is, first of all, it's about the environment and sort of the ecosystem of the leader, the individual, and where they're, what they're connecting with and where they're coming from. Then it's also about that environment that a group of people and an organization are coming from. Is that accurate? Yeah. So I, I very much uh, like the quote by Peter that you just read. And, and I think you could just uh, replace the word tree with field. And with that, I mean social field. And you have a pretty accurate description of kind of a, a lot what, as a change maker, you need to pay attention to. But the term of social field really has been um, of interest to me early on in my life and work. But then here, you know, in an academic environment and, you know, also more in the United States, I found kind of there was little receptivity some 20 years ago. But maybe partly because I'm now less paying attention to positive resonances or, or, or maybe just because, because I'm getting older or maybe because the, the environment has changed. So I'm, I'm actually returning to that term. And I think um, it is actually a very central term. And I really liked kind of what you read about the, um, the seed. So, for example, and it, it does apply uh, to social fields in the following way that you probably remember that many in many projects, when you start an initiative, when you form, like, say, a new company or a new enterprise or a new initiative, there is very often in a group that forms. Early on, you can feel the manifestation or you can observe the manifestation of a pattern that then later on in the life cycle of that initiative or of that project keeps replicating itself. It's not a natural law, in other words, so it doesn't have to really, but it's often the case. So in other words, in any kind of project, in any kind of initiative, what is the biggest leverage point? Where is it? And the answer is it's right at the beginning. It's right at the beginning. It's right when you form the DNA of the seed. And usually we don't pay attention to that. But given the quote, given the wonderful quote that you just read, what would you pay most attention to? Of course, the DNA of that seed, the quality of that seed. That's kind of of utmost importance because that will keep organizing the way how the resources are brought in and how, how growth is being organized, right? It's not the app that you put on an, on an iPhone. It's the operating system you know, by which all of these apps are uh, actually functioning or not. And so that's something that I have been, A, observing, and B, kind of in my own uh, practice, paying a lot of attention to. So, for example, 
if say you would run a big event, what do you do? Kind of the night before you convene the, the core group and kind of you intentionally, particularly at the launch of a larger initiative or project or you know, that maybe has kind of multiple cycle or year plus, multi-year cycles. So you convene the core group and then you, you stand in a circle and then you would just go around and everyone would share their intention. So it's kind of, in that case, the seed, the DNA, the seed doesn't really exist as of yet. Because as in nature, kind of, this is kind of a lot more defined by the seeds that we use. But in the social world, as human beings, we are much more intimately connected with the making of these seeds. So an intentional field setting, for example, uh, would include you stand together, you stand in a circle, and then each person would, would kind of uh, offer my or her highest intention, kind of why we do this, what we hope kind of with this launch event to bring into being, to bring into the world. And what I have been noticing when you do that, on average, kind of as this core group, so it's not scripted, right? It's, it's emerging from that, but it's, of course, uh, reflecting kind of everything you have been developing in this group before. When you do that, as a core group, you will, on average, be more likely to really um, connect to each other and to connect to what's emerging in that field and also to hold the space. Because uh, I would say in all transformations of fields, in all stories, kind of where we see the consciousness shifting from some ego system awareness to ecosystem awareness or from, let's say, a more silo perspective to a more systems-based perspective, Whenever that happens, it is a function of the quality of the container. It's the quality of the holding space that we, as the organizers or the facilitators, put into place. And that's pretty much, you know, you could say there are quite a number of analogies kind of to the role of the farmer, kind of, because what is the role of the farmer? Kind of, it's not extracting everything from the soil, but it's being a steward to the soil, kind of. Uh, helping to create the holding space, the conditions kind of under which the living ecosystem uh, can, uh, can evolve. So I have found like kind of many, not that it's uh, exactly the same, but kind of many of the founding principles are really the same or, very, uh, uh, or are at least kind of are quite similar. And that one of the differences, I believe, is that uh, in the social world, we as human beings are even more intimately connected with the forming of these seeds and therefore our own intentionality, our own awareness and our own quality of listening can have an, an, an even uh, bigger impact. How do you take this idea? I, I love the idea that you get to create the seed. That, that's fantastic because, I mean, it's amazing enough taking the seed of a tree and, and planting it and seeing it interact with all of the different things that create that life. But with an organization, you can create that seed. So do you have specific methodology or um, do you have something that you've created on how do you create that seed? First of all, knowing that you can do that, but then what do you do? How do you get together as a group of people and create the seed that you want to uh, have as the DNA of your organization? Well, just to, to clarify, I think, yes, I, I did say that. Uh, so we, we create or we co-create the seed. But it's also true that the seed is creating us, right? So because the process that your question is pointing at, of course, is a process where you do not impose. Where the whole point is uh, you go through you know, a broadening and deepening of your own awareness. And the whole point about that process is that you not impose your small will and your small intentions onto uh, the soil, onto the field, but that you open up your perceptive capabilities. You open up your mind, you open up your heart, and you try to access what we call the soft will, kind of the capacity to let go and let come. In other words, you tune into, so it's, you, you don't ask yourself, what do I want to get out of this, but more, what is it that wants to uh, uh, emerge here, That what is it that wants to happen here? So you, you put yourself into the service of that ecosystem, pretty similar to what a good farmer does also with his or her ecosystem. So in that regard, the creation of the seed 
can be a misleading title because kind of the seed. So what you really try to do is to sense and to tune deeper into the living ecosystem. And then, of course, given what emerges kind of from this um, sensing activity, you begin to crystallize and you begin to put uh, that more into focus. So it is a creative process, but it's not um, you know, a random process kind of where you just impose your, your, your old ideas. So how does that work? That's actually a good question, and that's kind of where I have spent probably half my life on, maybe half half my life. It sounds a little bit too dramatic, but, you know, I would say a couple of decades probably. And what we really found is that in order kind of in groups or in order in face-to-face relationships or in order as larger systems, to begin to create this condition where together we tune into a space of possibility, let's say we together put ourselves into a place where this kind of seed creation, so maybe that's a new word here, is uh, can take shape, right? It's actually a very nice way of describing what that is. In order to do that, you need to go through a preparatory process. And the essence of that process is, I mean, so I'm saying it a little negative now, is to get rid of the ego, right? Or to get rid of kind of your own old ideas. I think what we learned is kind of that if you want to go through this process as a group together, that usually there are like uh, three distinct spaces you're going through. And that's what we refer to as the you process. And we say you because kind of the shape of this process is, Stage one, really kind of going down the U, kind of you can picture that, the left-hand side of the U, and that process is really all about observe, observe, observe. It's all about kind of uh, getting out of your own bubble, your own institutional bubble or your own habitual bubble, and put yourself, immerse yourself into the places of most potential. Immerse yourself into... uh, the places that can teach you most about how to approach the problem or the opportunity you're going to focus on as an individual or as a community, you know, that that, that can teach you how to go about that. So there's kind of these, uh, this can have the form of learning journeys, this can have the form of dialogue interviews. You basically go to the places of most potential kind of where you're close to environments that, that that teach you how to deal with that situation or how to innovate in that particular situation. Number two, retreat and reflect, allow the inner knowing to emerge. That's more kind of so that the, the observe, observe, uh, going down the U is more kind of really going to all the different corners of the world, kind of wherever kind of uh, and also, in an intentional way, go, go going to the, you know, beginning to see your own system through the margins, right? You're going, you go to the periphery of your system. You, you, you try to see your own system from the edges, which, which means through the eyes of other stakeholders that are maybe less privileged, that are maybe have a very different angles, uh, angle on it than, than, than you may have. So from there, you go to the deep reflection space, the sense-making space, go to the deeper place of stillness where knowing comes to surface. And that's, that has to do with mindfulness practices. It has to do with individual and collective intentional stillness. And it also, you know, has to do with sense-making of what is it actually that we learned and also how does that kind of relate to our own journey. As an individual, kind of, what, what actually is the story uh, of the future that I and that we want to be part of? So all of that is what we call at the bottom of the you, kind of, so this deeper reflection uh, process. And then, you know, when two or three maybe possibilities of the futures or ideas uh, begin to crystallize from there, you explore these ideas by doing, by rapid cycle prototyping, by putting them, you know, rather than analyzing them to death, you take them and you run out small local experiments really quickly. And a prototype is not like an elaborate plan. It's certainly not a strategic plan. It's kind of more like something that you do very quickly that allows you to generate feedback from some of the other stakeholders that are relevant to 
what you try to make happen. So that's, in a nutshell, kind of these three stages, observe, observe, kind of, you know, really activating your own senses, right, and, and, and connecting with the periphery of whatever the system is you're, you're operating in, the deep reflection, and then the learning by doing. Those are the three things that we found are really um, helpful when you try to uh, move into this seed making on the level of the collective. We all know how to work with seeds and seed making, I would say, in our own individual practice. That's very important, right? And that in many, it's often called mindfulness, right? So in the morning, you get up a little earlier, you do your intentional stillness early on in the day, and that allows you then to move through the day, maybe a little less reactive and a little more connected to your own seeds, kind of to your own deep intentions. But what have we learned, really, how to apply these principles on the level of the collective? I think that's where the big challenge and where the big opportunity is. And that's why we try, with, from the Presenting Institute side, with this uh, new initiative, Transforming Capitalism Lab, that's where we try to make a difference. Because let's face it, there's a lot of excitement about mindfulness, and I share that. I have been part of that, but sometimes it's also really interpreted a lot too individualistic. And so why should I be excited that at Goldman Sachs now kind of uh, some of the bankers do their same old harmful extractive business practices with even more precision? So I should, why should I be excited about that? What's the progress in that? There is no progress in that socially. So what we need to do is, rather than just applying the principles of mindfulness and the cultivation of the individual, which is necessary but not sufficient, we also need to apply the power of mindfulness on the transformation of the collective, which means on the transformation of the whole system, which in our case means on the transformation of capitalism. I think that's the generation of our time. That's the, the call of our time. And that's where our generation really needs to create the seeds so that throughout the course of the century, our children and their children will complete the job. So back to the seed for a moment. So it's less about putting your ideas down or the group of people's ideas down and sort of creating a seed out of your own um, thoughts and patterns and more about as you say, sensing the the emerging future or the emerging sea that wants to be manifest. So you're getting to a deeper place of connection where you're sensing, you have some intentions about what you want to create, but um, the DNA of that kind of emerges as you pursue that process down into the bottom of the you or sort of the way of presencing, right? So it's much more of a collaborative sensing and I guess feeling into what wants to emerge than imposing your ideas from the outside. In that sense, I really like that because that also connects with nature and sort of the interrelated um, symbiotic relationships we see in nature and in permaculture in that uh, you're learning to connect with that that living soil of, of the social field. So by getting together with a group of people and doing that process and seeing that, uh, discovering, I guess, really more so than creating, you're discovering this seed and maybe it's a new seed that hasn't uh, been seen yet, you're entering into the creative process of nature, really, you know, because the, the whole idea of permaculture is working with the energies that nature already is already doing. You know, nature wants to grow a forest. And if you try and stop that, you can spend a lot of energy and time stopping things from growing. If you decide instead to harness that energy and just grow the things that you need, um, food, you know, fodder, fuel, etc. Then it becomes a, regen a regenerative process. So, what you're describing with this um, seed discovery, I guess I would call it now, is how you you enter into that um, that regenerative process in social systems and and uh, and communities. And that's that's beautiful. I really like that. I want to step back a little bit and just have you kind of define. 
um, what the crisis of our time is. I think we're all kind of aware of it, but um, the way you described that in the webinar that you did last week uh, was really helpful. So could you talk about that for, for a moment? I also thought it was in- interesting because I haven't quite seen it that way. It, kind of re- uh, it came out in our discussion with the creation of the seed. And so maybe just two more quick reflections on that and then responding to the end. The first one is, so creating new seeds actually can be also a problem, right? GMOs remind us of that. So what is actually the difference then between, say, GMOs, what Monsanto is doing, and and what we are trying to do? I'm not saying we are always successful, but the larger we, kind of we as a community. And I think a lot has to do with uh, moving from just kind of engineering something in abstract out of context or how much kind of the evolution of seeds is really embedded in sensing and trying to be in service of the living ecosystem that we are already part of. So the li- living ecosystem of Mother Nature, the, the living ecosystem that we also collectively enact uh, socially. And I think it's also reflected, this kind of shift of focus is also reflected in um, the field of organizational learning. I remember kind of when I, in, in the old days, kind of the more traditional way of doing organizational learning processes was basically that you follow, I'm just talking about design here. You follow a three steps, right? Step one is identify kind of the future, right? The future that you want to create. Step two, identify current reality. And then step three is identify leverage points, how to move from the old to the new, how to move from current reality to the future. So that this three step was basically a very widely used design. And I'm not saying it has created any bad results, but what I'm saying is that today kind of uh, we, I think we have really evolved from that. So when you look at Theory U as an example for not just systems change, but awareness-based systems change, then there is actually uh, a different sequence that we use. And what's basically different in terms of process is that we do a lot of sensing before. Because if you start with step one, define the future that you want to create, what's going to happen? Right? From a you process point of view, what's going to happen is downloading, right? Because you will project all your old ideas before cleansing yourself of them, right? You will project all these old stuff into the future, right? And then kind of you, you wonder why you run in the wrong direction. So I think from a you process point of view, the first stage that I described, the observe, 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 in reality is all about suspending your habits of judgment. It's all about empathy, kind of empathic and deep listening. And it's all about honing your capacity to let go and let come. So it's really all about sensing into the environment, into the larger living ecosystem that you are already part of. And then from that connection, you're going to form an intention and form an like, intention of the future and a vision of the future that will be very different than you might have generated when you start off with that activity. So that's just kind of from that process. I think there is an evolution in the field of organization learning and of systems thinking. And the essence of that evolution is that now, before we move into the visioning, there's a whole bunch of activities that we do that all have to do with sensing and with deep sensing, the sense making, the presencing, right? And what I, when I say presencing, what I really mean is the capacity to sense and actualize our highest future possibility. And from a you process point of view, it's really something that we not only dream up and impose on the reality, but it's a perceptive capacity. Just like a farmer is, a, what is special about when you run a farm? Basically, when you make a mistake, you look at least for a full year, if not much longer, onto that mistake, right? It's all about kind of the, the living ecosystem that gives you feedback that you tune into that is beginning to inform you. So you are not just arriving there with kind of some brilliant ideas, but it's kind of the living ecosystem that is teaching you. It's, you know, it's inspiring you to do the right kind of things. And 
so that's pretty much uh, is, is a good analogy, kind of what we have been also learning on the social field. But that was kind of the, the main reflection that I wanted to do on what you said earlier. In the realm of agriculture, you know, I've, I have a friend that decided to start a business and did not take into consideration the soil enough. And so when you're taking, when you're entering into an agricultural enterprise, the nutrient density, the hummus content, all of the different things in that soil are really important. And if it's not there, it can take years and lots of resources to get it there. And so basically in his case, it was sort of the demise of the business because it just, he didn't take into consideration enough and he didn't have the time and resources to get the soil where it needed to be. Whereas if he had found a, you know, a field that was already rich in nutrient, then he would have been way, way ahead and he may still, you know, may still be in business, if you will. So we're talking about the sensing of the emergence of the seed, the DNA, but also the quality of that, that soil, that social field. How do you assess and or create or enhance that quality of the social field? How do you assess and enhance the quality of the social field? Of, of course, that is a critical question, and I, I'm not kind of claiming that I found the answer, but I, I would say, like, in the field of awareness-based systems change, we have a whole bunch of really proven tools how to do that. I would say the first thing has to do with listening. You have to hone and refine your qualities of listening. And what that really means is that you have to progress your listening from all listening, which is listening based on what you already know, which really means you are not listening because nothing new is entering your mind, to uh, a second level of listening, which is, you know, that you discover new things. Kind of you, you, you appreciate, you, you notice kind of new data, and that uh, if that happens, it's an indicator that you are beginning to open your mind, that something new is, you know, uh, beginning to enter your horizon. A third level of listening, which really has to do with opening you're activating your empathic listening, opening your heart. And the moment that happens, you are not only contemplating new data, kind of new observations, but you are beginning to see the situation through the eyes of another, through the eyes of, say, another a stakeholder, kind of a, uh, another stakeholder in the system you're operating. So finally, a fourth level of or the, the, the deepest level of listening that we refer to as generative listening, which is not only empathic that you begin to see the situation through the eyes of another, which also is kind of connecting with emerging new possibilities. Think about what a great coach would be doing when he or she is attending to not only your current state, but your highest future possibility, which is, of course, what great teachers are doing, great educators are doing, which is what great leaders are doing. Think of Nelson Mandela, what he did in South Africa. So where, you know, you not only, when you kind of connect with a situation, connect the trajectory of the past into the future, but you feel, you sense into the highest future possibility, and then you connect with that potential. And you operate from that connection and the now. So I would say a lot of shifting the field has to do with deepening our quality of listening. A second thing I would say is kind of we have to shift the way we have conversations, kind of from downloading and debate to something that is more dialogic and that is more accessing the power of generative dialogue or of collective creativity. Number three, I would say we have to, because we live in a world basically through Facebook, through many other mechanisms, where the society around us is falling apart, right? I mean, we here in the United States, we are the prime example. We are no longer one country. We are at least two different countries who have very little to say to each other. I mean, that is the drama that is unfolding in front of our very eyes. And sometimes it's even kind of more. So the society is falling apart. We cannot stop this process. 
we cannot kind of undo this process. It's already underway. The only thing we can do is to find out how, in a context like this, we can regenerate the deep human connections kind of within and across these communities so that we rebuild the social soil that has been disappearing and that we see disappearing kind of uh, in, in, in front of our very eyes. So it has to do with dialogue and kind of changing the way we have conversations. But it also has to do, I believe, with maybe new, uh, new spaces where we make look at reality and look at things and kind of engage in sense-making together. Because it's not the case that today there's no sense-making going on in society. There is. The problem is that each part, kind of each organization, each sector, kind of each special interest group is engaging in their own silo of sense-making and then kind of applying their strategies against each other. I think what we are missing is larger spaces where we can engage in sense-making and in seeing together in the context of the larger system that, you know, that brings us together as partners, be that education, be that health, be that agriculture and sustainable food, you know, in all these key areas, uh, I think we lack mechanisms that allow us to make the system sense and see itself. And that, from my point of view, is the essence of systems thinking. So when I do work with organizations, when I do work with communities, what is the added value that I bring to these communities, that I bring to these organizations? It's this. Make the system sense and see itself. So, you know, 10 years ago, we would have said, make the system see itself. But then we realized just seeing itself is not good enough because that knowledge is stuck in the head. If I am not feeling the suffering of the other people in my community, we cannot really kind of unlock the um, collective intelligence in that community. So make the system sense and see itself. That's what we need to build enabling infrastructures for. It's possible. We have done it in many places. It's just not supported in the current institutional infrastructure that capitalism is providing for people and for their interactions. So I think that's one of the things um, that will be important to, to develop in the future and that will help us to improve the quality of the social, social field, not only in our small communities, which is already happening in many ways, but also on the level of the collective. There's so much more I want to talk about. At this point, since it, we're, our time is just about up, I wanted to, just to say one thing for anybody who's listening who is uh, wanting to hear much more from Otto. His book, Theory You, goes into great detail and much more detail into all of this. This conversation will, I think, help open that up even for you. And then his newest book, The Essentials of Theory You, is, in a, a, I guess, a, a more concise and abbreviated version of that that just came out recently. So he goes into a lot more detail. It's laid out very well. It's easy to understand. And so I would highly recommend that. Uh, I've been getting a ton out of it here, just been reading the new and recently. The other thing is, and I'm really excited about this, you mentioned the Transforming Capitalism Lab. So one of the things about social and economic transformation is it is much more than a thought experiment. But the only way to really learn it is to practice it. As, as we've learned in a lot of the disciplines in permaculture. And so this is a national or worldwide sort of event that's online, but there's um, local hubs all over the world where you can connect with people face to face and practice these ideas and concepts, practice sensing, co-sensing together, presencing. So I would greatly encourage people to get involved in that if you're, what you've heard today has resonated. So Otto, would you like to say a little bit more about the, the Transforming Capitalism Lab real quick? Absolutely. So uh, thank you, David. Uh, yes, the um, uh, Transforming Capitalism Lab is a platform that we from the Presenting Institute have been jointly developing with um, our colleags from HuffPost, Huffington Post, kind of the biggest online news organization. And 
the, the background really is because, um, you know, when you look into the world today, what do you see? You see a lot of negative things happening and you see a lot of positive things happening. But in our public conversation, only the negative stuff is amplified, right, through Facebook, through kind of the, the old traditional media, through social media and so forth. So what we try to do is to develop an amplification mechanism for the positive seeds, because we believe that the future, also the future of capitalism, which is the transformation of it, is already there. It's already existing, mostly in small communities, kind of mostly in local communities. So this platform is really organized to make visible the new economic narrative, make visible practical examples feature the change makers and their stories and also the tools that they are using so that other people could more easily replicate that in other areas and host intimate personal kind of uh, conversations online but also kind of uh, offline kind of in self-organized hubs. So you find kind of a whole set of methods and tools for that we'll have over the next two years, monthly live sessions with inspiring examples in each time in kind of many different ways of people connecting with each other, kind of with change makers and similar fields that you could team up with and develop your own ideas around. So the whole thing is meant to be an amplification mechanism for all the positive seeds of economic and democratic and, you know, cultural or, or educational transformation that we already see, but that often aware of themselves that they are actually part of a bigger global movement, I would say, that's currently going around. I think we live in a moment where a new global movement for civilizational renewal is, 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 is being born. And what is a civilization? It's basically the way we work and live together. And that's being reinvented as we speak. And the one question I didn't answer uh, of you, which is, what is actually the, the big problem today? And I, uh, I like to think about the biggest challenge that we face with our civilization today in terms of three divides, kind of it's the ecological divide or the environmental issues, it's the social divide or the issues around inequity and kind of our societies falling apart. And then it's the spiritual divide, which is our, you know, it's not the disconnect to nature, it's not the disconnect to others, but it's the disconnect to ourselves. And regenerating the foundations of our civilization, of the way how we work and live together, is basically uh, required today in a way that is bridging these three divides, bridging the ecological divide, that we use currently one and a half planets, bridging the social divides, kind of all the um, issues that I mentioned before around that, and also bridging the spiritual divide. I think that change is being born, it's going on, many of us are part of it, and that's what we try to link with this platform so that we can build on each other's efforts and, and, and amplify what we try to make happen collectively. And, and the platform is excellent. Um, I also wanted to mention edX, where there's several previous courses that with a similar format are available. I'll put links in the show notes to all of the above. Is there any other place that you would like uh, for people to find you and your information about you, Otto? No, I think so. It's it, it's the link to the Transforming Capitalism Lab. And then if you go to my um, uh, homepage, autoshama.com, kind of you also have a bunch of small video clips or other resources and methods and tools that might be useful. Okay. Yeah. And the, the Transforming Capitalism Lab just launched in the beginning of April and the platform is excellent. It's even uh, improved over what was on edX and it's got places for notes and writing down projects that you want to work on and prototyping and getting feedback from the community. So I think uh, it's going to be a really good uh, platform and experiment. And I think a lot of good, um, on the ground projects are going to come out of that. Um, well, thank you so much, Otto. I appreciate your time. I wish we had another hour. <laughs> are there any closing thoughts you'd like to leave us with? Uh, I think um, I, I spoke enough for now, and I, I'm sorry that uh, you know with our audience it could not be more dialogic. But um, I, I do feel certainly in the conversation that you and I have, kind of that 
uh, and then I have in other places that we live in a very special moment right now, kind of where kind of this emerging global movement becomes manifest in, in many different ways. But this movement isn't quite aware of itself. And, and that's kind of this uh, exciting moment we are in where uh, many things uh, move in the wrong direction, you could say, in the age of Trump, but also many ways, uh, move, many things are also moving in, in very hopeful directions. And that's in our public conversation, in our public consciousness, uh, often under attended to. And so realigning our attention with our intention, kind of uh, placing our attention on the fantastic local seeds that we have for our global transformation, I think can get us uh, a long way. And it's something that uh, I hope to be uh, uh, in service of. And that was David Bilbrey's interview with Dr. Otto Scharmer. You can find out more about Dr. Scharmer and his work at ottoscharmer.com. You'll find links to the other sources mentioned, including the Presencing Institute and MIT X U Lab, in the resource section of the show notes. What I like about this conversation is that Dr. Scharmer took us through the steps of seed making to observe, 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 then reflect deeply, and finally to take action. It reminds me very much of permaculture and David Holmgren's principles, observe and interact, and apply self-regulation and accept feedback. I'm reminded by this conversation between David and Otto that the ideas of permaculture can be applied to the breadth of human problems to develop solutions and to tackle systemic issues. That the breadth of permaculture has allies across many fields, including organizational development. Our next step, then, is to teach them and Dr. Sharmer more about permaculture. As you consider the ideas presented in this interview and practice permaculture in your own way, what is it that you want to emerge? On the other side, what is it that you feel wants to happen? Let me know. Visit thepermaculturepodcast.com and click on contact to send me a message. I'd love to hear from you. Until the next time, spend each day observing, reflecting, and taking action to create the world that you want to live in while taking care of Earth, yourself, and each other. The Permaculture Podcast is a production of Permaneo Group. Find out more about the Permaculture Podcast, including the extensive archives, by visiting our website, thepermaculturepodcast.com. Learn more about Permaneo Group and other projects at permaneogroup.com.